great evening to everyone. I am Ananthi, Faculty of Finance from Amrita School of Business, Amrithapuri campus. On behalf of our School of Business, I extend a hearty welcome to everyone for our virtual webinar series, The Great Amrita Alumni Conclave, organized by Directorate of Admissions and Academic Outreach. As part of the Alumni Conclave, a series of webinars are being organized, uh, spearheaded by our uh, shining alumnus. Uh, today's topic is Basel norms and its importance post-2008 financial crisis. I just would like to give a brief introduction about the topic so that uh, you will be more attached to the um, uh, topic, especially uh, here uh, it is uh, more relevant to the current situation. And uh, see, of course, the economic development of any country is dependent on its financial system, which includes its banks, stock markets, insurance sector, pension funds and other financial institutions. Of course, banks are the cornerstone of the financial system and an important tool for the economic development of a country. Of course, in India also, banking sector plays a crucial role in attaining the economic stability. Uh, however, uh, banks are exposed to a variety of risks and defaults because of lending to borrowers who carry their own risks. Uh, in the context of economic liberalization and growing trend towards globalization, Various banking sector reforms have been introduced in India to improve the operational efficiency and upgrade the health and financial soundness of banks so that Indian banks can meet internationally accepted standards of performance. Of course, this adoption of Basel norms is the main agenda for the banks now, especially uh, the 2008 financial crisis that occurred in the early 21st century hit the entire banking system across the globe. In order to strengthen and promote a more resilient banking system across the globe, Basel III norms were introduced. Presently, Indian banking system follows Basel II norms. Um, the Reserve Bank of India has extended the timeline for full implementation of the Basel III capital regulations uh, due to pandemic. Uh, in today's webinar, we are going to learn about what are Basel norms, why it has gained more importance in the post-2008 financial crisis, and how Indian banks uh, have been prepared enough to implement the Basel three norms. To discuss this in detail, we have our proud alumni, Mr. Sandeep here. I'm extremely delighted and glad to introduce Sandeep, who is from Amrita School of Business, Amrithapuri campus. He is part of 2009-11 batch. Uh, he's Bank of America in their uh, corporate treasury division. Uh, he has vast experience of 11 years working with top ranked companies like uh, BNY Mellon, uh, Society General and Barclays. His areas of focus is liquidity reporting and capital reporting as per Basel guidelines. Uh, welcome Sandeep. It's our great pleasure to have you with us. Now Sandeep will deliver his presentation for the next 40 to 45 minutes followed by a Q&A session and I request all the participants to use the chat box for their questions. Uh, over to you Sandeep. Hello everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, ma'am, for the introduction. Yeah. Uh, so, am I audible? Uh, uh, so, and uh, perfect. So, um, as uh, Professor Ananthi has, uh, you know, set the context. So, Basel norms and and what is its importance, the significance of Basel norms, and so what we are going to uh, discuss here is. So, we'll try to understand little bit about financial crisis 2008 crisis which is a, which was a massive crisis which we have seen our generation has seen in the recent past then what are the basel norms it its existence what we when you talk about basel norms or basel accord what is it what are the different nitty gritties of basel norms and then we'll discuss about what are the different types of risk which a bank faces on a day-to-day -day basis and then how Basel norms are trying to address these risks. Then we'll discuss about you know, being finance enthusiast, be it uh, you know, a student of finance or practitioner of finance who aspire to practice this Basel norms and understand the overall risk management framework of a bank, what they should do, you know, what, are the, what, what, should, what should be their focus areas, of interest and what should they learn so with this we'll start obviously this is a little boring topic and everybody knows finance is a boring thing but i will try to make it a little interesting with some examples so 
as ma'am already told if you have any question please drop your questions in the chat box and i'll try to answer all of them so let's start with uh, so th th these are the topics which i you know intend to cover but we'll see because this is a very exhaustive presentation which we had prepared for our some of our training uh, uh, content but uh, we will see that but let's start with something very basic that is a bank's balance sheet so everybody uh, should understand the uh, the balance sheet of a bank how it is different from an ordinary bank balance sheet of a manufacturing company so we know assets is equal to liabilities plus capital so if you see here so asset is uh, obviously both the sides should be equal but we should focus on this blue portion capital why what is capital like uh, all we call it as owners equity or promoters equity so for bank what is capital anything which the promoter or the owners have brought and start a banking operation so so if you see let's give an example here i want to start a bank so as professor anand you know uh, Uh, told in the introduction banks are one of the key pillars of every economy a good economy or a bad economy is differentiated by its banking system or its financial systems so banks play a very pivotal role in shaping the economy so if i start a bank so what is the first thing which i need to do i need to bring my capital then from there i will start on then what are the primary areas of a bank to earn money obviously i nobody starts a bank for charity right banks are a organization which is which is also having shareholders uh, you no know, uh, interest in it so when i start with capital from those very small portion amount amount of capital i create assets and from there my liability and asset books increase so giving an example here what are the different types of asset which you know, a, a bank has so it can be you know giving loan to customer like uh, suppose uh, somebody comes to me and ask me okay give me a loan so that loan will be my asset and what are the liabilities any person who comes to me and deposit their money their hard earned money as as their savings so that will be my liability so now we have to understand how with this and this process like you no know, giving loans to customer and accepting deposit from customer how does bank earns money assets are giving you interest like you earn interest out of it liabilities you give interest on those liabilities like let's say uh, for our simplification let's take an example i have given a home loan at 8% per annum and i have accepted a deposit from uh, one of the uh, corporate or a, or a retail individual at 4% so the difference is my earning now so this is called net interest income and obviously there are other factors like uh, you have to uh, give your uh, operating expenses like salary uh, your uh, other overheads now so this is where the risk come into picture when you give a loan to a particular customer you give on the basis of their credit worthiness now the credit worthiness of a customer will be known you now the bank will assess that particular customer's profile and the give loan but now what happens is not all assessments are accurate sometimes banks tend to lose money on those assets so in those cases bank should ha have the ability to absorb those bad debts in in common business terms we call it as bad debt so bank should have that ability to absorb those you know uh, losses and how do they absorb it by using their capital so this is the that is where capital comes into picture so if a bank doesn't have enough of capital anything a small incident which goes wrong that can create a so much of uh, 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 repulsion in the entire bank's balance sheet so that is why capital is a significant uh, contributor to a bank's progress so then 
similar to liabilities liability also you create liabilities by you know accepting deposit now what are the different different risk involved in the liability side now suppose i have uh, i am a bank and uh, somebody has uh, deposited their money with me now when they come to me and they ask me okay give me my money back if i don't have that money uh, or I, if i don't have don't have that reserve then in that case i am also exposed to a different type of risk so we'll discuss about these different types of risk in the subsequent slide but now since we understand the bank's balance sheet now we should push it to understand what is basel and how it hovers around the bank's balance sheet and its sound operation so uh, so basel is a city in switzerland so and what happens is during early uh, 90s or early or late 80s so all the central bank uh, authorities like uh, when you say when i say central bank uh, in india we we have rbi as a central bank we have uh, a federal reserve as a central bank of us then european banking authority or uh, they are the uh, regulators in you know uk and uh, across europe so these people they sit together and they understand the dynamics of banking industry across globe so economies are connected to each other like in globalization what is happening is like no economy can operate you know in a very secluded manner uh, so that is where the globalization and the economies are connected so these people these central bank people are the key representative of central banks they observe what is happening in the banking industry then they try to come up with some suggestion some plans some uh, regulation which will govern the entire banking system now question is what, you know you might ask you no know, how do we ensure that they have enough of knowledge because over period of time we understood we learn from what has happened in the past so that is where the main focus of basel norms is to coordinate the banking re regulation across the globe now when i say coordinate it means we have to understand a key difference between suggesting and implementing basel basel norms are suggested or it's a guideline provided by the the basel committee and the committee is constituted constitutes of 27 odd countries at the moment and they should, they have a administrative office in basel in switzerland so when they pen down some regulation they cannot enforce it what will happen is they will suggest to the local regulator who is the local regulator in the indian context rbi is the local regulator so they will suggest to rbi to fed to hong kong monetary authority or to prudential regulatory authority in uk they will suggest that okay these are the things your banks should follow for a sound banking for a system so then it is up to the regulator which country uh, you know adopts it completely which country you not know, tries to trim certain things and they adopt it it's up to the regulator so that is where the key difference which comes to picture and everybody should understand basel is trying to create a level playing field while they suggest something or or, or bring up a new regulation so it started in 1988 uh that that is where the first basel accord came into picture uh then in basel 2 came into picture when in during 2004 so what happens is during the process of uh, you no know, uh as the as and when banking uh, industries uh, uh progress initially we had banks were limited to only you know involved into those uh, conventional banking activities which i gave an example accepting the deposit giving the loans but as and when the banks are moving forward there are multiple different complex financial products complex banking uh, you know systems are coming into picture so what basel committee does is they observe these changes they try to come up with a a uh, solution 
which will address those potential risks. So risks are something which cannot be completely eradicated, but we can mitigate it with the by taking some actions or, or or implementing certain regulation. So that is where in 2004 Basel II came into picture. Basel II is different from Basel I. So when the regulator change anything, they don't completely change, but they try to keep a base and they add few more things or like a you know, step by step approach. Then in 2009 or 10, this is exactly after the 2008 financial crisis, the Basel III came into picture. So now let's understand very little about Basel I and Basel II. Then we'll discuss about you know, what are the different types of risk which you know uh, which are addressed by banks or, or by Basel III for banks. So in Basel I, uh, a primary focus was on capital adequation ratio. So that is where I you know when I, we discuss about capital. So capital is in a very important concept for every bank. It is absolutely uh, uh, impeccable for any bank to have a good amount of capital. So that is where Basel committee gave a guidelines that every bank should have a good amount of capital base. So that is where they brought this concept of capital adequacy ratio. So what is capital adequacy ratio? It is your uh, ratio which will calculate your capital upon your risk weighted assets. So Prior to this, there were no regulation or nothing called risk weighted asset. Maybe banks were doing it you know, in, a, in pockets, individual uh, side. But Basel came into picture and suggested that every bank should have a capital adequacy ratio. And they need to calculate it by taking their capital and divide it by their risk weighted asset. Now, risk weighted asset, again, as the uh, uh, word goes, when you have asset, every asset will have a risk profile attached to it. Like I uh, know we talked about uh, uh, the home loan or uh, a, a mortgage or uh, sorry, mortgage or education loan or any kind of loans which uh, or any kind of uh, derivatives where bank has involved themselves. So there is a risk profile attached to it. So banks need to identify the risk profile and they have to apportion certain amount of capital for those risks. What if if you have taken an unnecessary risk and you are losing a big amount out of it. In that case, since banks are public institution, like people like you and me and going and say, you know, depositing their uh, hard earned money. What if banks take a, a no, risk out of uh, no, uh, nowhere and it blown out of the proportion? So in that case, people like you and me are going to lose their money. So to avoid such a certain uh, you know situations like this, what banks do is uh, they have to keep a certain amount of reserve to eliminate or absorb the shocks which is coming out of a uh, this, this kind of risk events. So then banks, uh, the Basel committee gave a suggestion that okay, entire capital will be divided into two parts, like uh, tier one capital, tier two capital. So uh, like uh, these are uh, different types of capital. Like one is a going concern capital, one is a gone concern capital. Going concern capital is something which, you know, you it's a preventive measure. You know, uh, like in accounting, we we have learned about bank. You know, companies are going concern uh, entities. Like when the operation is going on, in those areas, what is the capital required? And the tier two capital are the supplementary capital or called as a gone concern capital in case of a you know, unforeseen event or a bad date or a dissolution, those capital can be used for uh, mitigating uh, or paying the, uh, the uh, required uh, portion which is due. So similarly, like the way the risk weighted assets will be calculated that was defined in Basel uh, one, like that is how the capital adequacy ratio will be calculated. So uh, we have an example here. Now I'm just skipping it for uh, uh, from the uh, no. We, we have a lot more to cover on these areas. Now, what happens in Basel two then? Like Basel one was the you know initial regulation which you know which talked about capital and which 
primarily focused on one type of risk that was credit risk because credit risk was the one of the important risk and probably at present you know entire uh, banking uh, uh, sector credit risk considered as the largest chunk of risk like roughly 70 to 85 percent of the risk is from credit risk then few other portion as and when uh, the globalization and banking industry progress we have some new risk like operational risk liquidity risk market risk these here came into picture so in basel 2 uh, the committee tried to address all these areas by implementing a three pillar concept what is three pillar concept like they try to address the capital by a pillar one which is called minimum capital requirements how much capital you should maintain like it was eight percent right so the eight percent was the capital adequacy ratio so that was the pillar one pillar two was regulatory supervision like banks need to take their ownership of the risk profile it should not be handed over to traders or you know uh, like uh, people who are operating on you know, a very front uh, front end but rather every individual should take the ownership of their risk profile bank needs to uh, have a supervisory mechanism a proper risk management framework which will address uh, the any kind of risk which bank is taking then there has to be a market discipline like since banks are public institution, they need to disclose their risk profile. They need to disclose their different different metrics which they prepare. Like uh, what is their capital position? What is their liquidity profile? What is their uh, you know uh, the the kind of risk they are taking? They need to document it and they need to publish it for the betterment of their shareholders. So that is where the transparency between banks and the customers or the potential customer or the shareholders and the government also stand in place like everybody should know what this bank is doing so if i talk about let's say uh, a bank a, a big bank like uh, let's say jp morgan everybody can or will know what jp morgan is doing by reading their annual report or there is a report called pillar three disclosure so if every bank has to uh, submit their pillar three disclosure on a given basis like on a given po periodic point of point in time so that is what basel 2 all about then uh, so yes this is a you know you know kind of a representation of the pillar 1 pillar 2 and pillar 3 that is where we discuss like it talks about basel 1 was talking about credit risk now basel 2 talks about market risk as well as operational risk then there was an ICAP uh, uh, in Basel II framework, which is like internal capital you know, adequacy assessment uh, practice, which needs to be followed by every bank. So similarly, supervisory framework, uh, proper risk, ma risk management framework, and with the pillar three, all the disclosure needs to be happen. Needs to happen. So uh, talking a little more about pillar one here, which is like minimum capital requirement, which primarily talks about your uh, capital adequacy ratio, how you are going to cap calculate your capital, how you are going to cap calculate your risk weighted asset. There has to be a proper uh, uh, regulation which banks need to follow while calculating their uh, capital. So one thing we, you know, everybody needs to understand, what is there in for bank here? So bank, as I said, banks are profit earning you know, entities. So they will definitely try to take higher risk because as uh, you know, in finance, the concept goes higher the risk, higher the reward. So they will definitely try to take higher risk at the cost of their sale, say, you know, the, uh, the depositors money. So that is where Basel Accord makes sure that whatever calculation, whatever uh, 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 risk weighted asset, whatever uh, capital adequacy ratio, all these things are being calculated that has to be properly governed and it has to be properly supervised by the local regulator. So the, in this concept here, you can see the credit risk, market risk and operational risk are there and how are the different different approach we follow to calculate their RWA, like to standardize approach, like foundation internal risk rating based approach, which is called FIRB. Then we have 
advanced internal rating based approach which is like AIRB. So how these approaches are different, the, the, there are multiple statistical models involved here. Uh, so how banks calculate it. So then pillar two, uh, again, this is the, uh, the pillar one in little more details about talking about your credit risk. Uh, yeah, and this is again operational risk. Oper why operational risk is in so much of focus? Because what what is operational risk? Let's try to understand with an example. Suppose I am a bank employee or I'm a trader. When I am getting into a trade, if I do something, uh, some kind of an operational error, like I have, suppose I have added another extra zero while entering the number, or if my, uh, no, well, suppose I, one of my ATM is big hacked or uh, you know, some kind of fraudulent activities was found in my banking system. In those cases, it is why these are classic example of operational risk. Why? Because they are impacting the day to day operation. And that is how the operational risk needs to be monitored and need to be managed. And what is the impact of this operational risk? It is not only the financial loss, but also it was a it impacts the reputation of a bank. Like what the one of the key, key strength of a bank is its reputation. Like when I said, you know, if I ask you about you know, who are the top banks, why people comes to you know JP Morgan, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Barclays, why these num names come into picture? Not because of their size of business. That is a portion, but the reputation they carry, you know, in front of their customer, right? So that is where operational risks came into picture, and it was under severe uh, scrutiny. So then, uh, talking about uh, the financial crisis, like now, this is a key, to you know, topic where. Uh, uh, Everybody knows what was financial crisis, what how, what kind of impact it created during that time. So long story, I'll not get too much detail about why the crisis happened, but I will try to give an example. What what causes caused this impact uh, or this you know, global crisis? So it was everybody knows about mortgage. Then mortgage was converted into mortgage-backed securities. Then it created a housing bubble. So when the bubble was there, it burst, and then the financial crisis happened. So, so in short, there were toxic assets, which uh, you know the the actual value of asset was less, but on the paper it was too high. So during this entire 2008 financial crisis banks were exposed severely on one type of risk that is called systemic risk it is it impacted the entire financial system of a bank or entire financial industry so that is where we saw saw few of the banks where uh, no they had to uh, go for bailout few of the banks they lost completely they're out of the picture now so in this during this financial crisis what happened is basel committee they observed what was wrong then they came into picture and they took some time and they implemented a new version of the regulation that is basel 3 so what happened during this time it was observed by everybody but the basel committee tried to find some of the potential risk and potential fix as well. So that is where they observed and they implemented or, or they uh, published this Basel III guidelines. Now, uh, so when this Basel III came into future, so what happens is when we are talking about a uh, banking regulation, it is very difficult to change the financial system in a, in a month or in a year in or it, it might take a decade like uh, so in some countries right now where Basel 3 has not completely implemented. So it or because it depends upon your system, your infrastructure, how your people as well, how how much uh, how much impact it will have 
on your bottom line, on your top line as well. So Basel committee, that is where they don't enforce it, but they suggest it. So it is like, you know, if I give an example, let's say take an example of Android. Android is an open source. It is available to everybody. Now, companies like or original equipment manufacturer, like, you know, uh, say OnePlus, Samsung, everybody, they try to take the base and they tweak it and they implement it on their devices. So that is what Basel 3 does or, or Basel committee does. Now, talking about Basel 3, what has changed? So we understood a little bit about Basel 1, why it came into picture. Basel 2, what are the change, those three pillars. Then Basel 3, what happened more? Like I said, the, uh, the committee completely they don't abandon the previous uh, guidelines. They add a little bit on top of it. So that is where in Basel 3 also they did. So those three concepts, the three pillars, like minimum capital requirements, supervisory review, and market discipline, these three remain impact, intact but they added a few more measures around it. So, and on top of those measures, like we'll discuss about uh, those, what are the changes in the subsequent slides, but what they did is they tried to address another key concept of uh, uh, every bank that is liquidity. So before we get into liquidity, we should understand, no, no, what happens when a bank is illiquid or what when we call a bank as illiquid so i'll give a classic example here let's say during our demonetization when the prime minister uh, announced the demonetization what happened is the old notes were not acceptable and there was a kind of a hue and cry everybody tries to go to the bank and try to exchange the money now, in these those cases, we, we, we everybody should have uh, you know noticed those the time lag or the the lead time between giving the new no uh, the uh, giving the giving back the existing notes and getting the new notes. Banks were heavily under pressure to supply or or meet those demands. So that was an example where a key liquidity risk comes into picture. So if I have to give a definition of liquidity risk or liquidity, when a bank is not able to meet its obligation to in front of their uh, you know, current uh, be it depositor or you know, counterparts, that time it faces a liquidity risk. So if I have cash, I have enough amount of cash, if any customer comes to me and asks me, ask back about my about their deposit i can give it back easily what happens is if i don't have it suppose i am having some kind of uh you no know, shares let's say stocks so what i have what has happened is banks well, depositor deposited their money i have as a bank i have invested in stocks i am holding the stock now when the customer or the depositor is coming to me and asking okay give me my money back in that case, I have to sell my stock and give money. So that time also banks faces a liquidity risk if the stock is not liquid enough, if the stock will not get proper buyer at a right price. That time also I am exposed to liquidity risk. So to eliminate this and in 2008 crisis also, everybody faced that. You know, everybody had enough of assets. Like you talk about uh, Lehman Brothers, their asset was so nice, like you know, it was very lucrative assets. But on the ground, those assets were toxic. It means those assets were not marketable. So that is where they faced the so much of trouble to convert that asset into cash. So to address that, the liquidity concept was introduced in uh, Basel three. So, so. Uh, so th th that is what, like, uh, if we talk about key elements, so the minimum capital ratio here, this remain still at 8%. But on top of it, there are few additional measures which was implemented. 
like the way banks were defining their capital that changed they need to be more critical stringent about to consider a particular type of capital as part of their uh, no as part of their uh, capital base so that need, that was changed so that is where the new three pillars of basel 3 were enhanced minimum capital requirement enhanced supervisory review and enhanced market discipline so they added this they didn't change anything on the uh, the pillar wise but they added few more calibers or levers to address the you no know, new types of risk you now which is uh, upcoming which was upcoming in the next century so uh, 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 that is where you know we have seen here like i we talked about uh, some additional levers like this is where the leverage ratio and liquidity ratio came into picture so leverage is like if we go back to my first example here so when i talked about banks balance sheet with this little amount of capital they are creating a leverage of this much entire assets so it is like it is like a you know going way beyond their capacity of leverage so if i have 10 rupees of capital i am creating a 1000 of assets out of it so then it creates so much of pressure on this red portion this is the liability which is nothing but your depositor money so that is where a leverage ratio came into picture and every bank needs to calculate their leverage ratio and there there is a minimum 3% to start with now it has you know increased to 5% for some banks so those are the ratios which came into picture which will address which address the different types of risk which we faced during 2008 crisis so similarly there are liquidity ratios which we'll talk about there are key there are two key liquidity ratios which were introduced in basel 3 and there are some other buffers like your your counter cyclical buffer capital conservation buffer were also introduced so we will you know we'll try to get a little bit more detail around it so so this table talks about the comparison between basel 2 and basel 3 the minimum ratio of uh, total capital to rwa it was 8% now under basel 3 it went to 10% 10.5% what is 10.5% this existing 8% plus this capital conservation buffer of 2.5% so what is capital conservation buffer so banks uh, the, uh, the 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 basel committee saw that no the 8% was not good enough so we need to make it more a uh, little more so banks need to keep some additional 2.5% of their tier 1 capital tier 1 capital so so that the the minimum ratio will go to 10.5% 10.5% which is even better then there uh, these are some some of the core changes like your tier on capital earlier it was 4% now it has you know gone to 6% then your leverage ratio was introduced as 3% then their counter cyclical buffer which is you uh, know which is uh, again banks or, or economy operates in different different cycle there is a boom there is a bust like when the economy is going good banks need to save or conserve little more like 0 to 0 2.5% of their capital this will be decided and uh, prescribed by the by their local regulator like in our case it will be rbi will say to each of their bank which who are under rbi whether they need to maintain a counter cyclical buffer or not so that will again add some more uh, uh, what you say um, lever towards the risk management of uh, the entire banking system then there are something called liquidity coverage ratio and net stable funding ratio these are very key ratios which was introduced part of the liquidity measures so so we'll talk a little bit about liquidity coverage ratio and uh, net stable funding ratio as i said in basel 3 liquidity was addressed the concern of uh, having lack of liquidity was addressed so liquidity coverage ratio talks about in a 30 day period 
how much you know high quality liquid asset a bank has to absorb the shock which is happening in their balance sheet so it is a forward moving approach where banks will forecast what are the types of outflow what i need to pay back to my you know potential customers or potential counterparties from their that basis i will have to calculate what are my assets current assets which i am hold, holding and those assets must be high quality when I, so the committee also described a clear guideline what are the like you know cash are the most high quality liquid asset then your treasury bill then your your sovereign assets and everything so there is a guideline around that now what happened in this this these cases so these are the some of the measures which improve the risk management framework of every bank and wh while the risk management framework is happening it is also improving the banks uh, uh, you know the confidence of customers or the potential customer or the reg local regulators or government onto that bank if i say that okay i have a good capital position then at least the regulators and the banks uh, will be happy uh, or, or the regulators or the government will be happy or the customer will be happy that, okay, okay this bank is good I'll, I'll go and deposit my money and i'll do the transaction was the primary objective of basil 3 so then there was another uh, ratio which you got talked about net stable funding approach uh, stable funding ratio or, or uh, in in our term it is called uh, known as nsfr so as i said liquidity coverage ratio or lcr it is a 30 day approach nsfr or net stable funding ratio it is a 365 days approach it's a longer horizon so this adds another lever or another risk management practice to the entire banking industry now so this is about basel 3 now as i said uh, you know, in the, the last or final portion of my uh, uh, discussion would be around what you know people who are aspire to you know practice these basel 3 norms in their job or if they want to get into investment banks what are the skills they need to have uh, or what are the uh, understanding they should have to uh, get into or or, or uh, to start their career in investment banks or financial institution uh, which are present today so there are two aspects which are one is functional skill set one is technical skill set when i say functional skill set this is a core finance skills like now finance most of our roles which are in you know investment banking domain are techno functional you need to have a good understanding of technology so what are the ty different types of technology i'll also cover in, in in brief but when i talk about a uh, functional knowledge a, a person should have good understanding of what is financial regulation so one of the key financial regulation is basel 3 or basel guidelines so what are credit risk what are market risk what are operational risk what are the different different products like we talk i i i give an example what are the mortgages what are what is repo what are the diff very common products like what are the what banks do, do with loans and deposit how it is uh, how it derives the earnings of a bank so these things everybody should know like you know all these things are taught in uh, in our curriculum like uh, you know if, be, uh, if a person is going for a full time mba obviously they need to go through all these topics in their first year as well as in the second year if they go for some core electives but what what is important is we have to not only read it from the bookies standpoint we need to understand the crux of it so that is the functional skill set now talking about the technical skill set like banks do very fancy uh, or use very fancy applications but you know if you see from the bird's eye view there are a few things like microsoft excel which is uh, you no know, you need to have good understanding around it and then there are uh, you no know, new tools which are called as emerging technology tools like tableau altrix sql 
these things which everybody should uh, know learn to uh, know uh, to use their both functional and technical knowledge and get into this investment banking domain yeah uh, that is it from my side uh, ma'am i i am okay to take some questions okay thank you very much uh, sandeep uh, indeed it was a great presentation and you elaborately and clearly discussed the role and importance of basel norms that i met uh, promoting a more resilient banking system in india uh, there are a couple of questions for you to answer yeah. um, uh, for example here now it is mandated by rbi to get all commercial banks uh, basel 3 complaint Uh, uh, of course, the, uh, already the deadline is over. Now it has been extended due to pandemic. Uh, what do you think? How far Indian banks are prepared enough in adopting Basel III norms within yeah. the stipulated time period? Uh, uh, when we compare to banks in developed countries? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, Indian banks, like uh, so, if I have to compare Indian banks with uh, the banks like uh, which are operating in US. so obviously the infrastructure is you know uh, there is a huge difference but what happens we have to understand little more about what happens if a bank is adopting to the changes which are you know prescribed by basel 3 or basel 3 guidelines they have to completely revamp their systems or it is more about data now like how much data i am able to capture from my customers and how much uh, you know accurately i can calculate these you know ratios be it liquidity ratios or be it capital ratios so the main challenges which faced by any indian bank is their penetration you know obviously india is a developing country and we have a fair amount of penetration in the rural market right so where we don't have enough of data and in india uh the central bank or the rbi plays a very pivotal role as as part of their financial inclusion and which is again uh, you know which is a, a kind of a big exercise which every indian bank has to go through and they have been doing it since last now i think a decade at least so it is absolutely difficult for a indian bank to completely change their you know reporting structure their uh, operating uh, system uh, operating uh, procedure in basel 3 but i think we are getting there like there are uh, uh, you know top banks like uh, hdfc access and uh, icsi they have a very robust uh, risk management framework and they are adopting to the basel 3 guidelines at least i know the liquidity standpoint indian banks have started calculating the liquidity coverage ratios they are trying to publish it to the uh, regulator like rbi so uh, it will take time uh, you know obviously the deadlines are uh, not uh, they are very steep uh, but i, I think uh, you know eventually we will be there okay thank you much and um, uh, one more question here we could observe that rbi mandates uh, to maintain a buffer capital conservation uh, of course in addition to minimum capital adequacy requirement mm -hmm. uh, for example as per the basel 3 uh, norms it is stipulated as ar of 8% but however uh, as per rbi norms indian banks have to maintain a uh, sar of 9% Mm, of course, in case of uh, public sector banks, it is emphasized that to maintain a maintain twelve percent. Of course, already uh, public sector banks do find it very difficult to maintain minimum CAR that we could understand. Will it uh, will it not be a burden for them? Is there any specific reason for that, or uh, what do you think are the challenges that would be faced by public sector banks in following Basel norms? It is absolutely. It is a burden. It is. any regular all the regulation which we discussed anything if a bank has to follow be it a big bank like jp morgan or a small bank like a, you know say canara bank every bank it is a burden for them because they have to adapt to some, some something new they have to change their system they have to collect the data in a more rigorous manner and accurate manner but what happens is why banks why rbi or you know basel committee prescribe this so there is a concept called too big to fail so in india 
most of our banks are you know, most of our customers are dealing with a public sector bank you no know, even though we'll have our salary account with hdfc somebody will have an additional account with sbi or you know or the other uh, indian overseas bank or whatever so what happens is we as customers we feel more comfortable with the public sector bank because you no know, they are full proof we we think they are full proof because government is backing them now that is the primary reason why rbi is suggesting little more capital adequacy ratio to this government banks because they are too big to fail there is a concept called globally systemic important bank so in india also rbi is trying to maintain that like from indian context there are some banks which are systematically important like you know imagine a situation where you know we, we saw the example of vijay uh, malya's case right where we had a big loan which need to be you no know, you know goes to you know bad debt and all so th that can create so much of ripple in the banking industry or in the entire system that it can hamper the existence of a you know proper sound uh, proper uh, risk management framework so that is the reason rbi is trying to make or uh, let people uh, let uh, the national public public bank to maintain a little bit of more buffer so that they can safeguard the interest of the normal public so yeah uh, i hope i answered your question thank you and from your discussion we can understand that banks are literally exposed to many different types of risks and uh, the, generally what sort of a risk management strategies that are being followed by them yeah. in case of uh, indian banks right so so banks uh, Uh, I, I'm not very sure about Indian banks' perspective, but I, I can talk about uh, you know, the European bank or American bank. What they do is there is a proper risk management framework which caters to each different types of risk. So it the so the it is basically the risk like liquidity risk or market risk or cap credit risk. They are centrally managed by a team called Asset Liability uh, Committee or it it called as ALM. so what they try to do is they try to observe what are the existing issues and how they can implement a sound framework like in case of a credit risk you no know, try to do too much of a scrutiny before uh, getting into a credit uh, risk related contract or in case of in case of a liquidity try to maintain a solid portion of uh, high quality liquid asset so these are the different different risk management framework and it is very much segregated in a such a way that you know there will be no uh, uh, lapse which will find you know anybody can find in the process like there are multiple process involved where if you go through a payment system it has to be properly approved by at least two three types of reviewers or you know maker and checker like there has to be four i check up there has to be you uh, know implementation of uh, like uh, credit risk standard like uh, like 5c model uh, like all these things these are a different and or or you know discounted cash flow model which will which will just uh, you know save the bank from uh, any potential risk okay thank you so much and uh, you were discussing about uh, there are a lot of opportunities in banking field um uh, could you please uh, tell us about the scope for mba graduates in the field of uh, investment banking and what sort of positions they can take it up of course you we were talking about various yeah. skills that they, they need to develop to crack the opportunities in investment banking uh, could you please tell us what sort of positions they can take it up uh, probably that would be helpful for them to understand right uh, so most of the most of the investment different banks they start with analyst level they you know they you know an mba which is you know who has a, a major in finance they can definitely opt for this analyst kind of role or senior analyst kind of role where uh, obviously the expectation is to have a good understanding of these uh, concepts which is related to investment banks like i talked about product concept i talked about uh, different types of regulation like basel and all so uh obviously uh, uh banks try to get uh, the fresh mbas to start their ground work to do their uh, uh, due diligence like you know if you talk about uh, uh, operational role 
there you might land up in some kind of roles which global compliance and uh, you know kyc management where that is that can be one of the uh, role if you talked about treasury then you can you know people can get into the uh, liquidity risk reporting role or uh, or uh, you know interest rate, interest rate uh, risk uh, reporting role uh, but yes it it varies the the positions might might vary but the responsibility we, we might be same like you know people needs to go through uh, apply their uh, uh, you no know, whatever the concept they have studied in their uh, day to day work and make uh, the risk management framework more sound and some of the roles which can be little techno functional as well like you no know, people can get into automation people can get into process efficiency and business process management where they need to understand what is the current process and how it can be you no know, it can be it can be make made uh, more efficient by you know using technology or by using uh, some of the new uh, ways of doing things okay one and uh, you were talking about uh, the different opportunities um, and students are more interested in doing additional certification support from whatever uh, we do teach uh, during our class uh, classroom sessions and could you please share uh, with us uh, what sort of certifications they need to pursue Uh, to track yeah surely uh, so mostly in mostly investment banking domain where as you know primarily catered by two types of certification one is uh, you know a re- proper risk management certification called frm financial risk management it is provided by garp g a r p uh, so it, it, this is a course which is like a two papers people anybody can go for it during their mba or after their mba which talks about the quantitative risk management it will talk about you know how uh, statistics plays a very pivotal role in managing the risk so that is an, obviously the old golden uh, cfa uh, chartered financial analyst role provided by cfa institute is also one of the key certification which any person who wants to you know st- kick start their journey in uh, uh, you know you know investment banking domain can aim yeah thank you uh, thank you so much sandeep uh, for uh, being passionate and uh, patient enough in answering uh, all of our questions and uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to join with us and share your valuable time amid your busy uh, schedule uh, i also thank all the viewers for their participation and meaningful questions uh, thank you once again thank you sandeep